from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The 1995 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures on the double life of RNA will be presented by Dr. Thomas R. Check, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, distinguished professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, and 1989 Nobel laureate in chemistry. The second lecture will discuss RNA as an enzyme, discovery, origins of life, and medical possibilities. And now, to introduce our program, the president of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Pernal W. Chopin. Welcome back to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for the second in this year's Holidays Lecture on Science. Our speaker today is Dr. Tom Check, distinguished professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. A few weeks ago, Dr. Check was here in town down at the White House where he received the National Medal of Science from President Clinton. You've already heard that he's a wonderful teacher. You will probably not be surprised to know that he teaches an introductory course in chemistry at his university. He's also trained dozens of graduate students, worked with high school science teachers, and especially encouraged minorities in pursuit of scientific careers. He and many other scientists are following a long tradition of mentoring young people like you. Why do we do this? Because it, the scientific community expects you to take up our work and carry it on into the future. It is you who will make the discoveries in the next century. We hope that you'll take inspiration from Dr. Check's talk. There's a revolution going on in medical research. Molecular biology is going to change all of our lives, not just in medicine, but in agriculture and many other fields. We hope that you'll be inspired by what you hear today. And some of you will pursue careers in science and per perhaps one day be giving lectures such as these yourself. I know that Tom will endorse that. He will now give his second lecture his title, RNA is an Enzyme, Discovery, Origins of Life, and Medical Possibilities. Tom Check. Thank you, Pernell. You can see that I've changed sweaters. I've got my historian's sweater on now because I would like to take a step back and answer a question which I know is always in students' minds, which is, how do you find out this kind of stuff anyway? You know, how, do you, how, how does one uh, make a new discovery? And before I address that question and then also talk about some of the unexpected spin-offs that came from the research, things that certainly weren't on our minds at the times we were doing the experiments, I'd like to just uh, review or recap a little bit from the last lecture. Uh, so remember that we're focusing on ribonucleic acid, or RNA, this uh, intermediary in the transfer of information from DNA to RNA to protein, because it shares with DNA the ability to uh, transmit biological information, but also shares with protein the ability to speed up, in a very specific way, biochemical reactions. And that... Um, we're used to thinking of a biological catalyst as being a protein enzyme, active site cleft, that has a uh, disposition of chemical groups in the active site of the protein that recognize and bind out of all of the myriad of tiny molecules in a cell. It's specific for binding one sort of molecule, in this case a small sugar, because it has a surface in that active site cleft, which is complementary to the surface of the small substrate molecule. What do I mean by complementary? Well, if you think about uh, a, a lump of wet or soft clay, and if you put a rock or, a, or your fist or something in that clay and then remove it, you now have a surface which is the complement of the object that you pressed into that clay. So that sort of physical shape that wherever there's a bulge in the small molecule, there's an indentation in the active site of the enzyme is one kind of complementarity, but there can be other kinds as well. For example, it could be in terms of the charge 
character. Where there's a positive charge on the substrate, there may be a corresponding negative charge on the active site of the uh, catalyst to, to bind the substrate molecule and recognize it relative to all of the other uh, molecules that would be present in the cell. And then having recognized it, the enzyme is able to promote a particular chemical transformation of that small molecule. Uh, and it does that by uh, stabilizing something called a transition state, which is a halfway point between the uh, original molecule before the reaction and the products. And by stabilizing that halfway point, it actually speeds up the uh, course of the, of the transformation. So that's been known about protein enzymes for a long time. And then we went on to say that ribonucleic acid, because of its single-stranded nature and sometimes taking advantage of not only base pairing between the strands as seen in tRNA, but also taking advantage of that 2' OH group, which is 2' just specifies a particular position on the nucleic acid chain. There's that extra oxygen atom, and that provides an additional handle, which can be used for folding of an RNA. Now, this transfer RNA molecule by itself is not known to have any catalytic activity, but when we move to uh, molecules from nature that do act as biological catalysts, we can see even in these two-dimensional views. So this is a flat sort of a road map to the structure of the RNA. It shows the first level of folding where A's are paired with U's and C's are paired with G's to form helical regions. So the, the linear chain folds by base pairing and then uh, Additionally, will fold into a three-dimensional structure, which I'll talk about in a minute. And we know of uh, quite a few varieties of catalytic RNAs found in nature. The one I'm going to be talking about, shown on the upper left-hand corner, the so-called group one introns. There are now uh, 325 or so, last time I checked, examples of this sort of RNA catalyst that has been found in nature in everything from plants to multicellular animals to unicellular uh, protozoa, such as the tetrahymena that you may have seen out in the lobby uh, on, the, on the microscopes that we have set up, um, also found in, in plants and in fungi. So very widespread in nature. Uh, hundreds of examples. Uh, group 2 introns, uh, not as many examples found so far, but also rather widespread in both uh, bacteria and in higher organisms. Uh, this ribonuclease P, which is studied by Sidney Altman and his co-workers at Yale University and Norman Pace and his uh, students at the University of, at Indiana University. Uh, this is a, an RNA molecule which interacts with a specific protein to catalyze a, a specific maturation process that results in a, a functional transfer RNA molecule. So again, it's RNA acting on RNA. Uh, but even though this RNA works in concert with a protein or proteins in the cell, it's the RNA part that very clearly contains the active site in the catalytic center. Here are a couple of pathogenic RNAs, uh, one of them that infects plants and another one that infects uh, humans, the hepatitis delta virus RNA. Again, a folded RNA structure that in these cases, uh, once it folds up, mediates cleavage of a portion of itself, a, a disruption of the polynucleotide chain at the position shown by the arrow here or the arrow over here. So this is just to give you a, a quick overview that these catalytic RNAs are folded RNAs. And if we now go from these two-dimensional representations to a model of a three-dimensional representation, I think you can see that we're at a point where the uh, RNA catalytic